Well, as you're, you could just please remain standing for a minute. Let's just pray together as we turn our attention to God's Word. Lord, we, we just want to thank you again. These Sunday mornings where we get to gather and sing your praises and worship you in your Word are our blood-bought moments. Because of the death and resurrection of your Son, we actually have the privilege of worshiping you in spirit and truth, and we have the privilege of doing so corporately. And so, Lord, the Lord's Day, Sunday morning, is in one sense another waking, breathing moment that can be an opportunity to worship you. And in another sense, it's so unique from every other opportunity this week. And Lord, we do pray that as we worship you corporately, as we gather as your church, and as we gather and sing these songs, as we submit to your truth, that you would do a work in us corporately, uh, that you would do a work through this body and through the power of the gospel lived out in this congregation that you would never do through uh, any individual. And so, Lord, we just want to begin as we open up your word this morning with just a reflection on, on where we're at, what we're doing, and to begin also with a plea for help as we seek to understand your word and to live it. And we know that you'll answer these requests. You always answer every prayer that's prayed in line with your character. And you love to glorify your name. You love to help your children. You love to give us light. You love to give us answers. You love to give us grace so that we can obey. And Lord, when we are humble and seeking your glory and seeking to obey you, seeking to be faithful to this city with your gospel, you are our ally, and all your power is disposed toward answering those kind of prayers. But Lord, we're also aware that we can at times pursue you, we might imagine we might pursue you, or we might be pursuing obedience, and we might be doing it in the flesh, we might do it for our own glory, we might even ask things that would be for selfish ends, and Lord, wherever there's a pride there, or a love of self, or a love of the world, we know that you won't answer those prayers, and in fact, we're, we can actually thank you that you are opposed to the proud. And so, Lord, we just we pray that, knowing that our motives are mixed, knowing that, Lord, we haven't even arrived. We do want to see your, you glorified, and yet we're, we're sure that there are areas in our hearts that we still have, have yet to see grace prevail. And so uh, we just want to thank you for being an ally and uh, giving grace to the humble and being opposed to the proud. So we pray that you would give grace to these humble requests and that you would oppose the remaining pride in us as a congregation. And so, Lord, we know that you can do all that through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's a privilege, again, to uh, be in God's word with you. And I want to ask you to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 2. The Gospel of Mark has just been so thrilling. I, I, um, I can't, can't tell you how, how exciting it is to just go back and week after week after week see the inspired account of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, I just am always impressed by what God does for his own glory through the word. I mean, there is just no greater way to see Christ's glory put on display than through an inspired, infallible, perfect account of the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we're not reading... A, someone's take, just a mere human take, a mere human interpretation of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are reading God's take on his own son. <laughs> and so it's just sweet. And uh, I, love, I love being able to dive into these narratives with you on, on Sunday mornings. And so I want to ask you to turn to Mark chapter 2, and specifically this morning, we're going to look at verses 18 to 22. Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, 
but your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, and the new from the old, and a worse terror results. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. This is a powerful story of an encounter between some critics and Jesus himself. They're attempting to undermine Jesus' ministry by pointing out that his ministry is not marked with the sobriety and the fasting that marked John's ministry and even the ministry of the Pharisees, quite ironically. It's attempted to undermine Jesus' ministry, and it's rooted in syncretism. Now, that's a big word, and what that means is this criticism is rooted in the attempt to really mix human thinking with divine thinking. Those two don't mix. We cannot mix truth and error. Uh, even better, we can say we cannot mix truth with human tradition. If you take divine truth and you try to mix it with human tradition or human interpretations, you're not left with just a diluted form of truth. You're left with no truth. Mixing truth and error or mixing divine truth with human tradition doesn't leave you with less truth. It actually destroys the truth and it ruins the truth. You think about this. This goes all the way back. The Lord warned us about this dangerous tendency all the way back, even if you think about the, the Ten Commandments, at the warning to make an image of God. He said, do not make an image of God, because the problem is, is there is no one like God. There's nothing like him. So when it comes to an image of God, what could I possibly create that would be worthy of God, equal to God? How am I going to create something that's like God? You know, as soon as I say God is like there is, in some form or fashion, there's an equal sign between God and then the blank that I'm about to fill in. God is like, and then what would I compare? And so the Ten Commandments, God says, look, if you're going to worship me, you've got to understand, there is no image. There's no image that correlates to me. There's no image. You couldn't possibly come up with something to say, okay, this is our representation of God. Because that would be to mix the actual character of God with some sort of image that man made up and created. And that'll never work. They, they don't mix. Instantly, you, know, you just don't have a, a, a bad version, a bad visual of God. You don't even have God. It's idolatry. It's idolatry because it exalts man's interpretation of God. I think God is like fill in the blank. And so now I'm making that my definition of God. And, and that's a, 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 a cardinal sin because God made us in him, his image, but what that is, is that's, that's a form of syncretism where we turn around and we start making God in our image. I think God is like this. And we rely on our own wisdom, our own understanding, and then we come up with this image of God. The same is true of the worship of God and, and the worship of man. Every time man tries to use the externals of biblical religion and to use those externals as a means of getting what he wants out of religion, it never works. Just think, for example, of the uh, famous example in 2 Kings chapter 17. In the, uh, after the, the northern tribes are exiled, you, you have in Samaria, you have all of these Assyrians who moved into the, uh, to the, to the nation of Israel, to the promised land, and they're sitting there over and over and over again as the story is told. They fear God, and yet they keep practicing idolatry. And it must be a dozen times the narrator says, they fear God, and they worship their idols. They fear God, and they did what they pleased. And finally, at the end of the narrative, 
the writer says, so obviously they, they didn't fear God. You can't mix the worship of God and the worship of man. Think also of uh, Paul when he wrote 2 Timothy. He says that you cannot mix the love of God with the love of self. He says in the latter days, men will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. The Apostle John says the same thing. You cannot love the world. He who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot mix love of the world and love of the Father. They don't mix. You cannot mix truth with error. This is, the, this is, the, uh, this is what's plagued religion ever since the beginning. It's not, that, it's not that religion is always a bad word. It would be a great word if it was purely defined by what God said in his word. The problem is, is when we redefine things and we uh, make it mean what we want it to mean and we impose our own interpretation on the forms that God has given us. And that's exactly what happens here in Mark chapter 2. As we dive in, I want you just to, to follow along. I want you to realize that Jesus gives us three illustrations of syncretism in this passage. All of these illustrations of syncretism are going to show the futility of trying to wed our own thinking with divine thinking, of wedding our own desire for how we want to worship with how God has required us to worship, or wedding our own understanding with God's wisdom, or giving our definition to his words. That's syncretism. And that's exactly what happens with this discussion on fasting. And so let's dive in and let's just pick it up in chapter 2, verse 18. He says, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And it's interesting, you see John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples now put together because of simply they are both fasting. And, and I want to be, I, I want to I just slow down here for a second because it is a little tricky to know exactly what happens when the story picks up in 18b. It just simply says, they came to him and said, and it doesn't explain who's the they. Uh, initially, it looks like, well, it's, it's John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples all at once. That, that, would be, that would be a little bit hard to imagine. That's possible, I suppose. But that gets a little bit awkward when you get to the quote, because then when they speak to Jesus, they actually refer to John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees in the third person. So it sounds like it's just somebody else. It sounds like somebody else is asking them about this. But for us to understand the story, Mark is pointing out that you've got to understand John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples, both of those groups are practicing fasting. So now we've got to stop and think about this because that just sounds, that sounds a little strange. So far up to this point, we've heard nothing but good things about John and his ministry, and now all of a sudden, and we've heard nothing but bad things about the Pharisees and their ministry, and now all of a sudden they're put in the same category. They're both fasting, and somehow they're at odds with Christ because Christ is not fasting and his disciples are not fasting. Well, how do we think about this? Well, let's just start with John. Let's start with John and his, his disciples, John and his ministry. Uh, it's, it, it's clear that, that John had a very strict diet. If you go back to John chapter 1, verse 6, remember, John was clothed with camel's hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And so, that's, that's his ministry. His ministry was marked. Not only did he have the garb, the uniform of a prophet, he had the diet of a prophet, and he was living in the wilderness. People are coming out to him. And so here he is, very strict, uh, very you know, severe. That's how the Pharisees viewed John. They viewed him as just severe. They viewed him as like this way too sober. It just, it, he's, too so, he's too intense for us. That was their, kind of one of their excuses for not being baptized by John. He's just, he's just too intense. And I guess you might be thinking, well, sure, I get it. The disciples of John, I mean, the dude is eating honey and locusts, so fasting is probably a good option. You might be thinking that was just a practical decision. Um, I, I had some fun with, with the, the diet that you could come up with. You know, um, honey locust Cheerios might be a good option if you, were, if you wanted a change in the diet. Or a PB&L. You know that one? See? Peanut butter and locust. BLT. Bacon, latest locust, tomato. See, these are dad jokes coming out. <laughs> and if you want a low-carb option, you've got locust lettuce wraps. I had to get that. See, okay, all right, good. You guys are tracking. The sarcasm is everybody's just oh, ugh, getting sick and weak at the knees. So John, is, he has this ministry, and it's very severe. It's very sober. It's very somber. And it's anticipating 
the Messiah who is to come. That's what's important about his ministry. It's, it's inaugurated months before Jesus is recognized publicly as the Messiah. He's anticipating the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and so it's only appropriate that John and his disciples would practice fasting. Now, you fast forward to chapter 2, and where we're at in this story, we're, we're, we're obviously beyond the, the preliminary period of John's ministry where he's anticipating the Messiah, and the Messiah hasn't started ministering yet. Now, obviously, Jesus is obviously ministering. I mean, they're coming to him in his ministry, asking him this question. And so now the question becomes, well, is this, is this, some, is, is this a story that we should put later? Like maybe when John the Baptist has already been thrown in prison and he's got these disciples who are just fasting, trying to get him out of prison, or, and people come up with all sorts of explanations. It's not really necessary to speculate about whether John was in prison or not. Clearly, Jesus is already ministering. That's all we need to know. The, the, the point is, is that in the, at this point in the timeline, fasting is unnecessary because Christ has already arrived. So you really only have two options when it comes to John's disciples in verse 18. When it comes to what do we say about why they are fasting? Either, you got two options. Number one, it's a reference to the fasting that would have characterized John and his disciples before Christ came. Or two, this could be a reference, we wouldn't know, but it could be a reference to those who followed John the Baptist but weren't true disciples of his message of repentance, and therefore they actually did not become true disciples of Jesus. Not everybody who was baptized by John was truly repentant, and you would know that if they followed Christ or not. But if somebody who was following John the Baptist then sees Christ show up, and his, and his own mentor, John the Baptist, is saying, here he is, the Lamb of God, who's uh, to take away the, blood, the, the sins of the world, and those people are not following Jesus, then they obviously don't believe in Jesus' message. So you have a couple options there. It could just be referring to that's what his disciples were known by legitimately, or there's still some disciples who actually aren't true disciples, and they're practicing fasting. Either way, it would make perfect sense for the entire flow of this entire narrative. And what that does is, in that sense, it puts them in the same category as the Pharisees' disciples because they're fasting. They fasted before Christ came, and they're still fasting after Christ comes. So they start asking Jesus about this fasting element. Now, before we get to Jesus' answer, verse 18 requires a little bit of explanation because when this question is asked of Jesus in verse 18 about why he and his disciples are not fasting and why John's disciples are, the Pharisees' disciples are, we've got to understand the meaning of baptism and then how it was practiced. First of all, it's important to uh, say this. There's only one fast that's commanded in the Old Testament scriptures, and that was on, at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16.29, it says, This shall be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall humble your souls. And that's actually a, a technical phrase right there. Humbling your souls. The word for humbling your soul is to afflict your soul, to humble your soul. And it's a phrase that ends up being used in a technical sense parallel to fasting several times in the Old Testament. So let me finish Leviticus, and then I'll, I'll show you a couple cross-references. On that day, you shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. Verse 30 goes on to say, For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you uh, to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Verse 31, It, it is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest, so that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. And so this phrase, humbling your soul, refers to fasting. It literally means to oppress, humiliate, afflict the soul. The same Hebrew phrase is used with the traditional word for fast, this traditional Hebrew word for fast. In Psalm uh, 35, verse 13, the psalmist says, I humbled my soul with fasting. And then Isaiah 58, 3 says, 
Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Literally, when it says humbled ourselves, it's the Hebrew, we have, we have humbled our souls. Also in verse 5 of the same chapter, Isaiah 58. Is it a fast like this which I choose? A day for a man to humble himself? Literally, for a man to afflict his own soul? And so, Psalm both Psalm 35, both Isaiah 58, use this phrase uh, synonymous with fasting. So really, the day of the Lord, uh, sorry, the day of atonement is the only day where fasting is prescribed in the entire Bible. That's important to realize. Now, when we fast forward to, toward, the, uh, toward the end of the Old Testament period, uh, after the exile, um, you have uh, traditional fasts taking place, and they're good. They're good and right because it's, it's a fast that's practiced by the nation. It's practiced by the people in anticipation of something. And let me just show you, uh, just, just listen to this. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 18, describes four fasts. But remember, this was practiced in the exile, the post-exilic period. The word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, and that's verse 18. Now verse 19. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. So love, truth, and peace. In the period of exile, realizing that the promises are not fulfilled, and they know that the land has been promised to Israel and to his seed. They're waiting for land promises. They're waiting for seed promises. When are we going to dwell in the land with all the blessings associated with messianic rule and reign? When's that going to happen? And so they humbled themselves nationally with fasts on four months out of the year. And God says, you know what I'm excited about? That's going to be sweet when those, months are, when those fasts are fulfilled with joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts. When what you're longing for in those fasts are fulfilled... Purim would make the fifth post-exilic fast. In fact, in uh, Esther 9, it describes how Esther and Mordecai wrote letters, and the king sent those letters out. In verse 31, it says, to establish the days of Purim at their appointed times, just as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had established for them, and just as they had established for themselves and for their descendants with instructions for their times of fasting and their lamentations. And so there you can already start to see a few of the purposes of fasting in the Old Testament are starting to converge. In that Esther passage, not only the the purpose of fasting, which is a longing and a, a setting your face to focus on God, especially with unfulfilled prophecy, and now also to seek the Lord, especially in the face of a threat, seeking God's favor. You also see in the scripture a few more uh, examples of fasting. And uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 37, describes the, uh, voluntary fasting, um, describing Anna in the temple. She was a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving day and night with fastings and prayer. So those are voluntary fastings that she was uh, uh, offering before the Lord because she is anticipating the fulfillment of all that she's, she knows from the Old Testament in, in, with, in faith. It's also interesting to note when you look at fasting in the scriptures that they are expected. Jesus himself says it this way in, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 16, sorry, Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18. He says, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He just says, whenever you fast, whenever that happens to be. It's not a command, but it's just an ex- kind of an expectation. It's like, when you do it, this is what it ought to be done. This is the motive. This is how it should be carried out. In fact, we could also include in that our passage in front of us, if you look down at verse 20, Jesus says flat out, as a matter of fact, it's not a command, but it is a statement of expectation. When the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast. And so fasting is expected. We also have examples of fasting from the apostles in the book of Acts, for example, in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, 
it describes the leaders of the church in Antioch, and they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. And then in chapter 14, verse 23, Paul and Barnabas are on a missionary journey, and um, they are appointing elders in every church. Having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So in these, in these seeking the Lord's face about uh, a missions decision for the sake of what, what do we do here for, for the gospel and trying to take the gospel to the earth, uh, they, they sought the Lord in fasting. Uh, in, in Acts 14, when they're inaugurating these churches and appointing elders, they're, they're fasting and um, commending themselves to the Lord. When you put all of these scriptures together, and we don't have time for all of these, I had to pull the uh, limit somewhere, you have several purposes for fasting in the Bible. Let me just give you the three major ones. Number one, concerning sin. Number two, it concerns mourning. And number three, seeking God's face for favor and for fulfillment. Those are the three real predominant emphases. If you look at, if you did a search on fasting, you would see those come up over and over and over again. Uh, even at burial of the dead of beloved ones, there's, there's fasting. Uh, when there's mourning over sin and grief and indignation over sin and guilt, there's fasting. When there's seeking God's favor for an answer and there's an anticipation of fulfillment, realizing what we've seen you promise in Scripture, Lord, has not yet been realized, there's fasting. That becomes very interesting. That's the point of fasting. It's to humble your soul, afflict your soul. <laughs> you have a natural appetite for food, and then when you afflict your soul in that way, it shows you sometimes how strong your desires are, and sometimes your physical desires are stronger than your spiritual desires, and that is a, an interesting way to train yourself and to remind yourself by a means of grace, am I really longing for the fulfillment of God's promises? And so this was what the church practiced. And of course, after the New Testament, of course, it started to quickly become perverted again in Didache chapter 8, verse 1, which is not an inspired document, obviously. It's just a, a famous document from the early church era. Uh, this document says, do not let your fasts coincide with those of the hypocrites. They fast on Monday and Thursday, so you must fast on Wednesday and Friday. And so there's a document that said, it recognizes, you know what? There are people who are fasting with false motives and unbiblical motives for their fasts. And their fasts are really worthless. But they do it on Monday and Thursday, so make sure you do it on Wednesday and Friday. There, solve that. Glad that was taken care of. Interestingly, uh, tradition would say that the, um, the fasts, according to the, the Jewish tradition, was observed on Thursday and Monday because, according to tradi tradition, Moses ascended Mount Sinai on Thursday and descended on Monday. And so that's how they got the Monday-Thursday combination. Um, but this is not the purpose of fasting, and it's not the, that's not the purpose. The purpose of this story now is to show the conflict between this traditional interpretation of fasting and what Jesus was actually practicing. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Jesus introduces the analogy or the illustration here of a wedding, and celebrating at a wedding is the picture that he uses to show the difference between what would be a true celebration at a wedding versus some sort of hypocritical version of it, and that really becomes the syncretism that is exposed in the Pharisees' approach to fasting and what would have been the syncretism of John's disciples if they were still fasting when Jesus, after Jesus started his earthly ministry. The, the, the verse 19 is fairly straightforward. While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? And the word attendants of the bridegroom has been debated, but if you must know, I don't know that it's a huge deal, but I do think it's better to read it as the attendants, the guests, as opposed to the bridegroom party. The traditional weddings in Judea would have a bridegroom party, a groomsman and bridesmaids. 
But in Galilee, they did not. And in fact, this phrase would have just been the translation of the Hebrew phrase. It just means sons of the bridal of, of, the, of the wedding party, uh, sons of the, of the wedding chamber. And it would have been used in this, in the Galilean version of a wedding, it would have been used of all the guests. And so it's simply describing those who come and attend a wedding. Um, it's interesting that he's pointing to something that should be obvious, because if you've ever been to a wedding, and in, in our traditional wedding is not quite like a, a Jewish wedding, a Jewish wedding would typically have been on Wednesday. That's like the wedding day. Why is Wednesday the wedding day? Because Sanhedrin met on Thursday. The local Sanhedrin would have met on Thursday. And so in order to affirm or, uh, or bring evidence that it was a Levitical or a, a marriage prescribed by the law in the Torah, they would get married on a Wednesday so they could go and have any evidence uh, that she had been faithful um, on Thursday. And so uh, virgins would be married on Wednesday, technically, and then it was traditional that uh, um, widows would be married on Friday. That's just the, that was just the tradition because of the schedule of the week and because they're trying to avoid Sabbath. And so you can't have a wedding on the Sabbath. You can't have a wedding the day before a Sabbath because you've got to clean up. You can't have a wedding after the Sabbath because you've got to prepare. And so all of those just create this panoply, a trifecta of what day do we get married? And so there you go. Wednesday for your first marriage. If you're a widow, it's a Friday. Um, and so Jesus comes along and points to the fact that, look, you know that when you go to a wedding, you don't fast at a wedding. And although the length of the wedding and the way it's celebrated would have been different, we know what this is like. We have a wedding, and it's traditional in our culture to have a, a reception afterwards. And imagine showing up at the reception of a dear friend or a family member, and you're there, and you are clothes are torn, you've got dust on your head, and the food comes, you're like, no, 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 no. I'm fasting today. And your gloom and your demeanor is just toxic to the celebration. Everybody's enjoying, rejoicing in what God has done and rejoicing in the, the creation of a new home. There's a, there's a marriage, there's a new family. And here's this guy who's just so self-absorbed and he's having his own little uh, morning party over by himself and he brought it to everyone else's, to, and here we are celebrating it. What a, you know, what a downer this is. And he just asks it in a rhetorical fashion. They obviously know that the answer is, is that's absurd. Nobody would do that. So he makes the statement, so long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The bridegroom's there. You're celebrating with the party. You're celebrating with joy. It's also interesting, you know, as I was looking at the, the traditional Jewish weddings, um, it's interesting that... Uh, uh, the, the way that they celebrated it sometimes got under the skin of some of the scribes. I, I found one passage, um, one, one Jewish scholar uh, from a long time ago, he was describing some, some background that was pretty fascinating. I'm just going to read this paragraph to you because I found this very helpful to understand what Jesus is up against here in verse 19. Uh, because what seems so obvious to us actually might not have been so obvious to the people who were asking the questions. So that's why I want to just Enjoy this. Just endure this paragraph with me for a second. I think this is helpful. There was a marriage feast, as on all these occasions. For this reason, marriages were not celebrated either on the Sabbath or on the day before it or after it, lest the Sabbath rest should be endangered. Nor was it lawful to wed on any of the three annual festivals in order to, or in order, as the rabbis put it, not to mingle one joy, that of marriage, with another, that of the festival, as it was deemed a religious duty to give pleasure to the newly married couple, the merriment at times became greater than the more strict rabbis approved. Accordingly, it is said of one that to produce gravity, so he's, he's like, this is too much fun, too much celebration at this particular wedding. He says that in order to produce gravity, he broke a vase worth about 25 pounds. And the, the, the scholar who was writing this a couple hundred years ago was from Britain, so came up with 2,500 pounds, or 25 pounds, sorry. Another rabbi said that at his son's wedding, he broke a costly glass. And a third, that being asked to sing, oh man, you're asking me to sing at a wedding? Now you've just totally crossed the line. That's un un totally uncalled for. He said, woe to us, for we must all die. For it is added, it is forbidden <laughs> to man that his mouth should be filled with laughter in this world, as it is written, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. When is that to be? At the time when they shall sing among the brethren, the Lord hath done great things for them. So in other words, 
we don't want to celebrate this wedding too much because we should really only be that happy for the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And so they end up having, well, just throwing their sucker in the dirt when it came to celebrating at weddings. <laughs> We're not going to celebrate that way. Jesus is alluding to something that should be common knowledge, but interestingly enough, it's actually already exposing many of the Jewish rabbis and Pharisees. But in verse 20, Jesus gets to the point and says, but the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. What's helpful about verse 20 is, as I was studying this, I, I, I had so many commentators just mentioned, well, what's happening here is this is a, a, a passage where Jesus is pointing out that the old is, is passed away, the new has come. And when you get to verse 20, that just doesn't work anymore, does it? Because if the old is gone and the new has come, well then, oh, it's back as soon as he leaves. He says that in verse 20. Uh, uh, when he's taken away, then they're going to fast. The point is not, this is not a, a statement or a teaching about transition from um, Old Testament economy to New Testament economy. It's a statement about fulfillment. Jesus is saying, you guys know the purpose of fasting. The purpose of fasting is anticipation of the, the fulfillment of the kingdom. That's why you fasted for centuries after the exile, realizing we got kicked out of the land because we still don't have our Messiah. And then you're back in the land under Zechariah's ministry, and you're still fasting because you know that it's not the land. You know it's the Messiah reigning in the land. And so they fast, and they keep fasting, and they keep fasting. And Jesus says, why would they fast? I'm here. This is a statement, this is a profound statement of saying, I am the Son of God, I am the seed, I am the Messiah. How could you possibly fast while I'm here? But he obviously does allude in verse 20 to the fact that his disciples will fast after he is taken away. And so, I know that this is not the point of the, of the, the, the little narrative here, but I do want to, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, some of you are probably asking the question in light of what I just shared about the purpose of fasting, how should I think about fasting? And, and so this passage isn't necessarily a direct instruction on fasting, it's, it tells us about the nature of it in an, in, as he's exposing a wrong view of fasting, but what would be the right view of fasting? And so I just, wanted, I just jotted down a few things, practical advice about fasting. And again, knowing that this passage is not about how you should fast, it's actually <laughs> why, why they're wrong for not fasting. Let's just bring together some biblical teaching and, and uh, kind of summarize what we've already seen so far. Number one, just remember, when it comes to you making a decision about fasting, just remember, Jesus actually never commands Christians to fast. I read to you the Didache. <laughs> it, does, it commands you to fast, but that's not even from God. That's just uh, made up. Jesus never commands his, us to fast. But number two, it's also important to recognize that he expects that his followers will fast. So his words were in Matthew 6, when, whenever you fast, whenever you do it, this is how you need to do it so that you get the attention of God who sees what happens in secret. It's between you and God, no one else. If it's for, for somebody else to see, then you, that's, that's not even the purpose of fasting. In verse 20, obviously it's expected. He just says, when, when I leave, they will fast. He just says it that simply. Number three, let me say it this way. If slash when, if slash when you fast, it must be for biblical motives. I, I summarized the three major ones. Sin, mourning, expectation, anticipation of seeking God for his favor and for fulfillment of what he's promised. And then number four, it's really important about how you would go about it. If you decide to fast, think about the nature of it, going back to the original terms, describing it even as afflicting your soul. 
if you go without something that you crave, and again, we're talking about something that God, it's a God-given appetite, the, the, the appetite, a mechanism that says, hey, I'm hungry, I need to eat. God has given us food to be enjoyed with thanksgiving. There's nothing wrong with eating. Uh, that's obviously in a clear in Scripture. So now we're going without something that, that God's given us that's good, like food, and, our, and we're curbing a physical appetite. We're afflicting our soul in that way. The, the, this must not be done in an ascetic manner as if severely treating your body is some sort of, in some sort of way atones for anything or earns you something or merits anything or it impresses God or it impresses man. It doesn't impress anyone. Any of those motives are gospel-denying motives. The only reason why you would, the only motive for, for um, fasting in this way, it must be done from a heart that longs to see spiritual desires exceed physical desires. That's why you would fast. Sometimes you might find yourself saying something like, well, Lord, here I am. I've got sin. Let's just talk about the, the context of sin. Here's sin, Lord. How do I think about this? I see sin in my heart. Uh, you, 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 thank you so much for dying on the cross to atone for my sin. The only way I can have a clean conscience knowing that I'm a sinner is because of the blood of Christ. You died to take away that guilt, and you also died to give me power over that sin. And so maybe there's a context where you would be fasting, and you'd be saying, Lord, I have, I have a desire to eat, but more strongly than the desire to eat, Lord, couldn't my desire for righteousness and holiness exceed that? Think about the context of Anticipation of fulfillment. Do you ever find yourself looking at the promises and looking at heaven and looking at the promise of the kingdom and looking at the glory of God that he's going to get globally when he returns and thinking, if only I could see that. I'd give anything to see God get his proper glory right now. And maybe... There's a humbling of your soul with fasting that says, man, Lord, I, I really, I'm, I'm really hungry. C couldn't my desire for Christ getting glory exceed my physical appetites? That would be, as best as I can see it, from all of the biblical passages, the only reason to fast. But clearly in this passage, the celebration of, at a wedding, the celebration of a wedding is the illustration that Jesus is using to show the futility of syncretism. We got two more. Let's quickly look at those. Uh, verse 21, we see, um, verse 20, uh, yeah, verse 21. In verse 21, we see the patching of a garment the patching of a garment. Verse 21, Jesus switches metaphors. He creates a new analogy, a new, a new word picture, and it's one of somebody who works with fabric. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. Okay, this is a very simple word picture. He uses a word that means unshrunk. It's a, it's a root. The root of this word is the word for somebody who works with fabrics. Sometimes that word has been translated fuller or a, a bleacher or a cleaning, like, like you think of somebody like a, like a dry cleaner, like the uh, first century AD version of a dry cleaner. Um, and it, it was more than just cleaning in the sense of bleaching. It also had to do with shrinking clothing because it would be treated. And so if, if, you, if, if it was translated in such a way that, didn't, that left out the, the shrinking element, that clearly would be uh, errant. Here, it's, it's, it's exactly right. It's a patch of unshrunk cloth. Uh, you know exactly what that looks like. You know, um, you, you, buy a, you buy a pack of, un, of, uh, of, of T-shirts that are not pre-shrunk, and you put them in the dryer once, and they become your kids' T-shirts. I mean, that's just how it works. So you have to buy them pre-shrunk if you actually want to wear them more than once. Jesus says, look, nobody does that. Imagine if you use the patch, and you, you patch the hole with the, the unshrunk. It's not pre-shrunk, it's unshrunk. Then all of a sudden, you throw it in the dryer once. Well, nothing happens to the old garment, but this thing just shrivels up to like a little prune. It becomes half the size. Well, it just rips out, and it actually makes the tear worse. It ruins the, it's a waste of time, it ruins the patch, and it ruins the garment. It's a very simple and obvious word picture. 
Third word picture. In verse 22, filling of wineskins. Filling of wineskins. Look at verse 22. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Now, the wineskins here, you know, this is like a, a leather type of, uh, you know, made out of animal hide, animal skins. And so it's kind of like a soft version of a canteen, you know. It's just, it's soft, it's like a leather bladder. You would pour wine into it, and it would actually be in the middle of the fermentation process. Um, what would happen is, that, you know, as, as wine would ferment, that would be uh, lees. Lees are the, uh, like, basically it's like the breaking down of yeast particles. Um, when, um, when the yeast is, is fermenting, enzymes break down the yeast and it creates these little particles called lees. And you would strain out what you could. You'd strain out the biggest portion of lees. But sometimes they would even leave some lees in the wine because that continued to flavor it. And so then when that's done, when you've reached that level, that's like a halfway point. Maybe that's not technically precise, but that's the middle of the process. The remainder of the process would actually happen in the wineskin. And so they would pour new wine into the wineskin and it would continue to ferment. That fermentation process continues to put out new gases. And so it would expand. Now, if a wineskin has already been used, if it's already had wine in it, and then it's dried back out. It's already been stretched and then dried back out. Well, now it's kind of crispy and it's not so, not so expansive anymore. It loses some of its property. And so if you put new wine into a wine, uh, wine skin, it's already had wine in it. It doesn't have that elastic, this isn't the same function and property of, an, of a new wine skin. And so in that case, fermentation continues. It might look okay for a couple of weeks, but then it's sooner than later, it's going to burst the wine skin and you ruin the wine skin and the wine. Waste of time, waste of a wineskin, and waste of wine. You wasted everything. There's nothing left. The point is obvious from all three word pictures. You mix divine truth with human tradition, you're, you're left with nothing. 80% truth, 20% tradition is not 80% true. It's, you're left with nothing. 60% gospel, 40% human thinking, you're not left with 60% of a gospel, you're left with nothing. You mix truth and error, you try to make a syncretistic mixture of religion as given by God in the scriptures with religion as we want it to be. You are not left with true religion of God with some degree of impurity. You have no religion, you have no worship of God. Syncretism is impossible. It does not work. I want to just talk about two implications of this discussion that Jesus gives us on integrating truth and tradition. One thing you learn from this paragraph, one thing you learn from this showdown between these critics and Jesus, is you learn that similarities are superficial. There are superficial similarities between true worship and traditional worship, and that's due to the fact that external actions can be quite similar while fundamentally being totally different. This is because Christ must be the substance. What we read in this paragraph, it's interesting, it, 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 actually, it actually indicts much of the Christian church today. And I, and I kind of just was studying this text this week, wondering, have we lost our will to discern and to discriminate between similar external forms and the fundamental reality or the substance of our worship? The, the fundamental reality and substance is exactly what Josh just mentioned in our communion. It's the person and work of Christ, and not just any person or work of Christ, not just any work of Christ as defined by me, not just a person of Christ as described by me, but the person and work of Christ as defined by him in his word. That's the substance. In this story, what's interesting is in this story, we don't see some of the more overt forms of syncretism, the really bad varieties of syncretism. You might have thought when I mentioned syncretism at the very beginning of the sermon, you might have thought, okay, yeah, trying to mix Christianity with like the, the, the lower class of our culture. And of course, that's just, that's just age old. I mean, the, the, 
The syncretism of contextualization is just as old as the church because everybody's desperate for more popularity. And so if you have a culture that likes movies, you give them movies and then add some Jesus to it. You have a culture that likes music, you give them music and add some Jesus to it. You have some culture that likes anything, you just give it to them and then you just add some Jesus to it. That's contextualization. That's about as lowbrow as it gets. What's interesting about this example is that this example of syncretism is actually a form that's given by God. Namely, fasting. This isn't some made-up form. This isn't like, man, you know, we just took worship to another level with our smoke machine. And this is like, that's actually biblical fasting. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. This is the most subtle form of syncretism. Because externally, it's actually something that God puts a high view on. That's what's so fascinating about this. And so if we look at the externals of biblical Christianity, you can, you can actually extract the guts of that. You can take out the significance, the substance of that worship, and you can be left with the external practice and have nothing. Nothing. The second implication is intermixing is impossible. Syncretism is impossible. When worshipers come up with their own definitions and they impose their own ideas on Christianity, the result is not half Christianity and half worship of man. It's entirely the worship of man. They just don't mix. So what I did is I kind of want to just leave you with a list of a few examples of how we've tried to syncretize. You know, syncretism can be a theological syncretism. A theological syncretism would be the mixture of, of competing views or competing beliefs. Um, we've seen this in the church, the attempt to syncretize biblical faith with secular, unbelieving psychology. We've seen the attempt of the church in the last 150 years try to syncretize a uh, biblical view of creation with, a, with an unbelieving view of evolution. We've even seen theological uh, syncretism when it comes to how we got our Bible and inerrancy when there are Christians in the last hundred years, quote-unquote Christians, who have said that, hey, uh, the word is from God, but it's actually written by man. So it's divine in its origin. It's written by men. And so just like, you know, you have um, the two natures in Christ, God and man, well, then here you've got a divine element and a human element. And so the fact that it has errors in it doesn't mean it's not from God. It's just got the human element. And people have said that. It's syncretism. Those are all three in the theological category. How about another category? How about methodological syncretism? We've seen the church syncretize itself to the world methodologically with a cultural mandate. And you look at a secular culture that says, man, if we just had a Christianity that would make this world a better place, that'd be, that'd be doing something. That's the kind of Christianity I could respect. None of this preaching business, but just making, making the world better. That's the kind of Christianity I like. And so we've, seen, we've given it to them. Ever since the social gospel started in so, such profound ways in 1890, we've given it to them. There's another methodological syncretism, uh, namely utilitarianism or pragmatism. You say, what's that? Well, that's just the idea that the church so often defines what it's doing methodologically by what works. Did it work or not? So we do what we think works, and then if numbers increase, we say it worked. If numbers decrease, it didn't work. <laughs> that's utilitarianism. <laughs> Never mind the fact, are we asking the question, is God building his church? Is Christ building his church? Last I checked, he is. And uh, number two, am I so arrogant to think I can build a church better than he can? Another methodological syncretism is what I've already mentioned, contextualization. contextualization. When we start doing ministry the way that the, the, the culture wants, that's just the next generation of pragmatism. What about a fundamental syncretism? A fundamental syncretism. What about when we take the Christianity that we practice and it actually is devoid of the substance of the person and work of Jesus Christ? Because you realize that they're not asking him about something that's not in the Bible. They're asking him about something that is in the Bible, namely fasting. This is where it really becomes subtle. 
I mean, we could have doctrinal statements, we can have external practice, they can look so similar to the biblical ideal. Fundamental syncretism could be living a life externally to look like an upstanding Christian, to make a name for myself in the church as an upstanding Christian, devoid of celebration at the accomplishment of the finished work of Christ. Here in verses 18 to 22, you've got people fasting, and the Messiah was here. What's wrong with fasting? Well, nothing wrong with fasting. You should be anticipating the arrival of the Messiah, and you should have one of those desires to be through the roof. Oh, I want to see the Messiah come. And then here he is, and you're like, yeah, we're fasting. Why aren't you? What? You understand why the critics who would have asked this question rejected John's ministry. Matthew 11 says, you didn't want anything to do with John, Jesus says, because he sang a dirge. A dirge is what you would sing at a funeral. He's mourning. He's lamenting. He's out in the wilderness. He's eating locusts, wild honey. He's fasting. Oh, he's too severe for us. And then he turns right around and says, and here I come, and we're playing the wedding feast, and uh, the, the, the wedding, we're singing the, the, the flute, playing, you know, in celebration of the wedding, and you won't play that game either. The, the, these critics looked at John's ministry and said, that's too severe. They looked at Jesus' ministry. He drinks wine. He, he, he has meals with, with sinners. And they have criticisms of John for being too severe, Jesus for having too much fun, because they don't like either one's message. Why do they reject either one? Because they have created an external Christianity we'll call it external Judaism, devoid of the sum and substance of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're worshiping themselves. They have turned the externals that God gave into a means of self-promotion and self-worship. I want to leave you with a, with a charge from Jeremiah. Here's a helpful, I found Jeremiah chapter 23 to be very helpful as I think about this very reality. Jeremiah 23, the prophet is describing how, how profound it is that the word of God does not mix with the word of man. The word of God does not mix with the word of man. Verse 25, I'm sorry, chapter 25. <laughs> sorry, chapter 23, verse 25. I'll get there. Jeremiah writes this. He says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name saying, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long? Is there anything in the hearts of the people who prophesy, of the prophets who prophesy falsehood, even these prophets, of the deception of their own heart, who intend to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal? The prophet who has a dream, he may relate his dream. But let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, the Lord declares. What he's saying there in verse 30 and 31 is that you've got all these false prophets, and they're giving so much, so much promotion of messages and meaning that the true meaning of what God has actually said to his true prophets is being drowned out, and they're stealing God's words from the mouth of the prophets as a whole. Verse 32, Behold, I am against those who have prophesied false dreams, declares the Lord, and related them and led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. Yet I did not send them or command them, nor do they furnish this people the slightest benefit, declares the Lord. There's no benefit. There's no benefit. I mean, these people have taken the externals of what God has said, redefined it, given it its own meaning and its own message, and the people who listen to that message have no benefit. That's exactly what happens. In the chapter, in the, in the narrative we just read, Jesus' uh, critics have actually come to Jesus with this mindset of they have made a habit of redefining truth according to their own self-love and their own self-will. And now they're being exposed by John's message. They're being exposed by Jesus' message. And they have no truth whatsoever. 
This is a tragic story of the utter impossibility of mixing divine truth and human tradition. They do not mix, and they, what is, what, like, like Jeremiah says, what does straw have in common with grain? Is not my word like fire? And is it not like a hammer which shatters rock? It's utterly distinct. Lord, we're so thankful for this narrative that helps us to remember that we cannot possibly bring anything from ourselves and mix it with what you have said. We want our worship to be pure, Lord. We want it to be true. We know how easy it is, and even as I went back through these verses, I, 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 I'm, I know that it's so easy for us. It's so easy for those who have grown up in the church or who are familiar with, what, with the practice and the routine even the familiarity of Sunday morning, the Sunday morning of weekly ministry, and the Sunday morning of Bible study, and Sunday morning of reading our word privately and even reading it together as a family, and all of these routines, which in and of themselves are great. But this text would beg us to ask the question whether we have grown comfortable with the externals and we've really lost sight of the substance. And uh, we thank you for the profound exposure that that was for those skeptics who came. And what a profound instruction that was for Jesus' own disciples to sit there and watch with awe as Jesus makes no unashamed claim to, he's, he's, not, he's not blushing, he's not apologizing. He is claiming to be fulfillment in person. He is the seed. He's the Son of God. He's Messiah. And he's standing in their presence declaring that fasting is totally inappropriate. But then when he's gone, it would be appropriate again. And, Lord, to think that we know you, that we have a relationship with you, that you are the sum and substance. What we celebrated in communion is the very source of our worship. Um, and, and yet here, here would be the exposure of even the ability to do communion merely externally and to view that as something other than what it is, simply a remembrance of the once-for-all atonement rendered at Calvary for every sin that would ever be forgiven all at once. And so, so Lord, we just pray that you would help us. Thank you for the clarity of your word and thank you for this sober reminder. We would be fools to think that we could mix something with Christianity. I pray that we would take all of our ambition and all of our desires for our life, especially those that pertain to church, family, work, ministry, school, class, sports. It's pretty much should cover it, Lord. We, whatever ambition we have for this life, we pray that it would terminate exclusively and only on the glory of Jesus Christ. And Lord, wherever we have desires that we don't surrender, we would be very tempted to kind of bring that into our Christianity and bring that into our worship and define our worship according to our own desires. So protect us from that kind of syncretism, Lord. Thank you so much for the grace of your word, which always refines us and examines our motives. So we know that your word is living and active, and it will discern uh, the thoughts and motives of our own heart this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.